The story you're about to see will shock you. You'll come away questioning your faith in our system of justice and how it failed a young woman with so much to live for. Renee believes she'd met the man of her dreams. She said his name's Braden and he's 24. Except she hadn't met him at all. Are you Braden Spiteri? Someone else was writing their story. Sort your daughter out, she's threatening to kill herself. I can't be without you, baby. You're my With wife. a tragic ending. Do you regret what happened? I trusted you. You came into my home. A liar is exposed. Pure evil would be the best way to describe her. But will there be justice for Renee? She hasn't gone in vain, and I'll make sure of that. The Gap in Sydney's eastern suburbs. It's a dramatic and foreboding place. The scene of up to 50 suicides a year. In 2013, 20-year-old Renee Marsden took her own life on the day a turbulent 18-month relationship ended. It came as a terrible shock to her parents, but over the following weeks and months, they would discover that Renee and their entire family had fallen victim to a monstrous deception. For Renee Marsden's parents, Teresa and Mark, the memory of August 5, 2013, is forever etched in their minds. What was the first inkling that you had on, on that day that something was wrong? On the Monday morning, Renee got up like normal, went to work, and she always got mm. home about 2.30, 3 mm. o'clock in the afternoon. And um, I was standing at the bench and she walked in. And I could tell there was something wrong. I just looked at her and she, she was deflated. She wasn't crying. I could tell she was upset. And she just walked past and I said, is everything all right? She said, I'm, I'm fine. It's OK, Mum. And she walked upstairs to her room. And then I, I received a text message from Braden. Braden Spiteri was Renee's boyfriend of 18 months and a prisoner serving time for manslaughter in Goulburn Jail. He sent Teresa a text message from behind bars. What did it say? Sort your daughter out, she's threatening to kill herself. That's a difficult moment for any mother. So you, you obviously went straight up to speak to her? I did. I walked up to her room. She's sitting on the edge of her bed and I sat beside her. And I said, I have a look at this. And I showed her the text message. I said, should I be concerned? She said, don't be stupid, Mum. And I said, what's it all about? And she said, I finally found out what he's all about. She said, you don't have to worry about him anymore, Mum. It's over. Braden had been in jail for most of his relationship with Renee. They'd only ever communicated online and had never met in person. But that hadn't stopped him taking her on an emotional roller coaster. Braden's blunt breakup message to Renee signalled the end of their relationship. Or at least that's what her parents thought. What they didn't know was that Braden would exchange a further 91 text messages with their daughter that day. Went back up to her room to check her and she's getting changed. And I said to her, what are you doing? She said, um, she's reapplying her makeup. And I remember saying to her, um, she was pinning her hair up. 
And I said to her, why you got such beautiful hair, Renee? Why don't you just leave it down? It's beautiful, you know? She said, no, mum, I'm just going out to dinner with the friends from work. It's all, it's all good. I said, okay. I said, are you going to be long? She goes, no. You know, Renee was never out late. Mm -hmm. If Renee went to dinner. I'd be home at 9.30. Renee gave Teresa every impression she was okay before she left home. Teresa had no idea that her daughter was driving towards the Gap, Sydney's most notorious suicide spot. Just before 6 p.m., Renee sent Teresa a final text. And what was the message? She said, Mum, I love you, and I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry for my water. I always love you. Yeah. She said, I'm sorry, you're my best friend. Even at that point when she sent me that message, I, I look back and I think how much you must have been hurting and for her to still care about how I felt. Alarmed by the message, Teresa drove to a friend's house to discuss it with her. Once I showed my friend that message, she said to me, I think maybe we should ring the police and they put out an alert to see mm. if they could track her down. The police began their search, and it was soon revealed that Renee had sent two other texts. One to Braden, who had just dumped her, and one to her best friend of five years, Camilla Zaydan. I actually called Camilla the night Renee went missing, and um, I asked her, I said, have you heard from Renee? And she said, yes. She received a text message from Renee and I said, what did it read? And she said that she loved her and that she was sorry. And she said, what's wrong? I said, oh, Renee hasn't come home. She said, not a problem, I'll come and pick you up and I'll drive you around to where I think Renee would go. And I said, fantastic. So she did, she came around here and she picked me up with her mum. We drove to McDonald's where she thinks Renee would have went. And she also took me to Braden's sister's house, apparently lives in Glenhaven. So we drove up to this house. I went to get out the car and she said, well, Renee's car's not here and I don't think Braden's sister lives here anymore. So she's obviously not here. Meanwhile, the police had wasted no time tracking Renee's phone to Watson's Bay near the Gap. We had the police come round about nine, mm. nine o'clock and said to us, um, more or less at that point, it wasn't good. We and can't find her. We We're searching the area, but we can't find her. And um, we found her car, we've taken the car. I got upset that they took the car because I thought if she's gone for a walk and she comes back, the car's not going to be there. She, she won't know what to do. Did the police tell you what they found in the car? No. No. They didn't? No. Inside Renee's car was a Valentine's card from Braden and Renee's old iPhone, which she had stopped using two months earlier. Police also discovered that Renee had used her finger to scrawl, I love you, Braden" on one of the car windows. You and I drove down there, didn't we? We were panicking. We were worried. We went down and did our own walk around, trying to find her, calling her name. We probably spent two hours. I think we got a few hours sleep, and then we went back again in the morning. And we found two, a pair of shoes. Yeah. I did find her shoes. I picked them up, and I looked at them. I got quite upset. And um, I think behind me was a police officer come up and she took them off me and told me to put them back and she removed me from the scene.
There was a point where the police had to be very honest with you about their fears. What did they say to you? The police said, uh, go home, virtually go home and prepare a, a funeral. Renee's body was never recovered. It was most likely swept out to sea after she jumped. Mark and Teresa blamed Braden for Renee's suicide. He dumped her on the day that she died. They messaged him, but he failed to reply. So they turned to Renee's close friend, Camilla Zidan, for answers. She was the only one who'd met Braden in person. But Camilla seemed more interested in Braden's welfare than mourning the loss of her friend, Renee. Camilla comes to you in the, in the moment of your utmost grief. Yep. And she wants you to think about Braden. Yes. Mm. Yeah, she said to me, he's hurting too. And I think it was you at the time said, yeah. how, how would you know if he's hurting? How? And she said she actually spoke to him. He actually called her. And he's hurting, so we have to leave him alone because everyone's blaming him. I said, um, I've given the police Braden's phone number and she, her demeanour changed straight away. You got to get it back. She said, you got to ask for it back. And I said, why? So nothing was making sense. So Camilla was starting to say things to us that wasn't making sense. Next. He said, oh, there's an app that can help us. How a 13-year-old boy helped reveal the true identity of Braden Spiteri. I, I was shocked. Renee Marsden took her own life on the day her boyfriend, Braden Spiteri, dumped her from his jail cell. To understand their relationship, we need to go back to her previous relationship with her first love, Angus. Renee, I met whilst uh, getting a haircut at uh, an old place she used to work at, Miss Elizabeth's Hair Studio. She cut your hair? No, she didn't actually. So funny story, she was the trainee apprentice, the hairdresser apprentice who, when I would come in, she would wash my hair and give me a head massage. I used to go in, not needing a haircut, but just to, as an excuse to see her and meet her. She was very bubbly, beautiful, kind, very down to earth. Oh, you're recording. Before long, they were dating. And you made plans together. You had a contract together. We did. We came to a conclusion that we would have four kids, um, a, a Labrador, and uh, wrote up a funny love contract with each other early on in the, in the relationship. They were the best years of my life when I was with her. It was a very good relationship. And unfortunately, what was going on behind the scenes, I just had no idea at the time. Behind the scenes, Renee's close friend Camilla was bad-mouthing Angus. She wanted an end to the relationship. I was quite blown away and, and left questioning how and why such a good relationship that I believe, such a loving relationship, had such a quick ending with so little explanation and reasoning. I later on found out that it wasn't so much what I did, but it was all part of Camilla's plan. She had really deteriorated Renee's mental health by constantly pestering and pestering her, wearing her down, and feeding her false stories. The night she came home, told me she had just broken up with Angus. We sat at the end of her bed and she she was just crying, she was sobbing. And I said, what's wrong, Renee? She said, I just told Angus it's over. And I couldn't believe it. Camilla, who had poisoned her friend against her first love, now steered Renee into another relationship. You hear this name, Braden Spiteri. When was the first time his name was mentioned? She said, I've, I've been speaking to somebody. And I sort of st stood back and I, who you been talking to? And she said, his name's Braden, and he's 24. And I went, it's a bit too soon, don't you think? She said, no, no, no. 
Camilla's introduced me to him. And it was her ex-boyfriend. Camilla Zaydan had been Renee's best friend since year nine. The two were very close. So when Camilla introduced Renee to Braden Spiteri via text and social media, he seemed like a good match for her next boyfriend. She couldn't see Braden or talk to him, but there was a reason for that. Camilla had told Renee he was in a, involved in a motorcycle accident. He's best friend was on the back of that bike. He was killed and Braden was sentenced to manslaughter, sent to Goulburn Jail. But Camilla had arranged for a phone through his lawyers. The family was very wealthy and he can keep in contact with Renee. Renee's parents thought the situation was bizarre but they wanted to support their daughter. All you're interested in is your daughter's happiness. Yeah. And this person seemed to make her happy. Yeah. 100%. Um, he was saying to her mm. everything she wanted to hear. Well, everything yeah, she wanted right. to hear. He, he knew that she wanted what her goals were. She wanted to get married, wanted to have kids, wanted that life. He knew yeah. all that. Camilla told Renee she could not see Braden in jail because he'd given up visiting rights in exchange for a reduced sentence. Camilla claimed Braden had illegally obtained access to a mobile phone but could not make voice calls. The only way to contact him was via text and Facebook. Their dialogue was intense and took over Renee's life. At one point, I, I sent a message to Renee through uh, Facebook, and he responded. And that's when I first found out he had her passwords. And I, I said to him, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to my daughter. So you need to leave. And she said, Mum, that's Braden. And please don't speak to him like that. I said, well, it's true, Renee. I don't, if I want to have a conversation with him, I'll contact him. I don't want to contact him, I want to speak to you. So he started to come in between Renee and I, yeah. Braden hated that Teresa kept in touch with Renee's ex-boyfriend, Angus. I made a comment on Angus' Facebook profile. He had done something and I liked it. Braden, he sent me a nasty message and it said, how dare you? How dare you like your daughter's ex-boyfriend's message? What sort of a mother are you? And he called me an unfit mother. He made me feel so bad. I, I was shocked. It was the first message that I've received from him. And I'm reading this thinking, what young man speaks to a girl's mother like that? But at that point, I didn't want her to pull away from us. I still wanted to have that relationship with her. So I said to Mark, let's just let it go. Months after Renee's apparent suicide, police were still trying to understand what led her to take her own life. The answer could have been in her new mobile phone, but that went into the ocean with her. Police still had her old handset, but they couldn't unlock it. And so that was returned to Mark and Teresa. This was a crucial moment, which would lead the Marsdens to the truth about Renee's relationship with her boyfriend, Braden. The Marsden's 13-year-old son, Luke, had a friend who believed he could crack Renee's old phone. He said, oh, there's an app that can help us. Got online. He said, the app's $100. We paid for it uh, with our credit card. And 10 minutes later, he downloaded thousands of text messages from the phone. These were scrambled, though. It took some yep. work to... Yeah, yep. it took some work, but we were told by the police at the time that had the phone for months and were unable to, for whatever reason, get the yeah. text messages. Yeah. He was able to do it with a $100 app. 
at 13. What Mark discovered was staggering. Over three months, from March to June 2013, 11,000 text messages, mainly between Renee and Braden and Renee and Camilla. Mark began to look for patterns as to how and when the messages were exchanged. I plotted on our spreadsheet all the conversations between Renee and Braden and Camilla and Renee. And when you plot them on a chart, you can see that it's pretty obvious what's happening because when Camilla's Camilla, she'll text Renee four or five, six, ten times. And then there'd be another dozen text messages between Braden and Renee. Braden stops his text, Camilla starts texting Renee. It wasn't as if they're all intermixed, they're in segments, in and out. At that point, I realised and I said to Teresa, it's got to be the same person. I sent that chart to the police and they came back and said, yeah, it's from the same tower. They're one of the same people. Braden is Camilla and Camilla is Braden. Coming up. She'd caught more than 16 times. How Camilla Zaydan took control of Renee's life. You hide, I'll hunt you down. How could you live with that? Mark Marsden has just discovered that Renee's boyfriend, Braden Spiteri, does not exist. He was invented by Camilla Zaydan using two mobile phones. Two phones, personal phone that Camilla uses to text everybody, all her friends, and one phone dedicated solely for correspondence between Braden and Renee. And you realise that that moment that Camilla had been in total control of Renee's emotions, your emotions, your whole family's emotions. Yep. And friends, everybody. Everybody. With a story that was so well put together, it's faultless. It would have taken a lot of time for her to put it all together because even now I look back on it and I don't think I could have written a better script myself. Now, you're not police, you're not lawyers. Yeah. Mm. What did you expect would happen to Camilla? We thought that she'd be... Shit, there'd be, there'd be some... Um, charge put to, uh, she'd be charged for something. Renee had been catfished. That's when someone uses the internet to lure, deceive and manipulate others, usually for money or in romance scams. I spoke with Marilyn McMahon, a professor of criminal law at Deakin University, to find out more about catfishing. Well, catfishing does raise a number of possibilities in relation to criminal offending. The ones that immediately come to mind are stalking and intimidation, which has been used to prosecute people who've engaged in catfishing before. You think about the sort of scams that involve financial fraud, and there are various criminal offences that can be utilised there. You think about uh, the Commonwealth offence of using a carriage service to menace, harass, or offend a person. So having run through those offences, though, in the case of Renee Marsden, you see that none of them immediately seem to be applicable, and that is really the challenge. The New South Wales Police had never seen a case like this before. The creation of Braden Spiteri was clearly linked to the suicide of Renee, but Camilla Zidane had not broken any laws because no money had changed hands. So, no crime had been committed. This was a terrible blow to the Marsdens. They knew just how much control Camilla had over their daughter. Camilla was, was obsessed with Renee from day one. I don't think at any stage did she ever leave Renee alone or for any length of time. Renee confided in one of my nieces that Camilla had pinned her up against the wall and made sexual advances towards her. 
I think from the onset, Renee was frightened of Camilla. Camilla's much bigger than Renee. And Renee didn't know how to handle that. She's never been in a situation like that before with someone so aggressive and mm. full on. To understand more about Camilla's hold over Renee, I caught up with Renee's cousins, Stephanie and Michael. Stephanie went to the same high school as Renee and Camilla. And did you ever know Camilla? Yes, I did. So if I met her in year eight. She was magnificent at driving a wedge between Renee and I for about three years. Why? Um, I, she was just jealous. She didn't want Renee to sleep over my house anymore. She didn't want Renee to come to the movies with me or to parties with me, to go out clubbing with me. If Renee did have a sexual relationship with Camilla, it was brief. Renee was interested in boys. When she left school in year 10 and started dating a boy, Camilla's jealousy flared in a chilling prelude of what was to come. I swear to God, kid, you're going nowhere. Do you understand? You abuse me, I'll laugh. You kill me, I'll be your ghost. You hate me, I'll still love you. Run away, chase you, you hide, I'll hunt you down. When Renee enrolled in a hairdressing course at a local TAFE, Camilla soon followed suit. And whenever Camilla could not physically see Renee, she stalked her on the phone. Renee and I were traveling to Bondi. It's about a 50 minute car ride from where we are. And in that time, she had called more than 16 times. And I just remember thinking, like, you've got to be joking. Like, what? who in their right mind calls 16 times? Like, even somebody in an emergency wouldn't call an ambulance 16 times. And Renee was just like, it's all right, don't worry about it. And I just had, like, anger against it, because I couldn't understand how could you live with that. And that was just 50 minutes. Like, can you imagine a whole day? You wouldn't have any free time. And if you did, you'd have so many different thoughts going through your head. Camilla even saw Renee's mother as a threat. I think deep down she despised the fact that Renee was so close to me. And that showed in the fact that Renee, on Mother's Day, she got a tattoo and she had my name. I'll never forget it. I, I, I nearly died. I thought, why would you do something like that? But she had down one side of her, um, down her side, didn't she? Down mm. her torso. Life is beautiful because of you, Mum. And then she had my name. And Camilla did everything in her power to have Braden's name put on her. Renee agreed to get a fresh tattoo of Camilla's alter ego, B. Spiteri, inked on the right side of her chest. This was just three months into the relationship. Camilla was now inside Renee's psyche, manipulating her friend's emotions at will for her own amusement. However, she also knew when to pull back. There's a period where it stops. How did that happen? That stopped because of my comment to Camilla and to him. I said to the both of them, if you were half a man, you would leave my daughter alone while you're in prison. And he then said to Renee, um, I agree with your mum. I think it's only fair that you just sort of do what you got to do, but when I get out, you're mine. And she agreed. And then she started to go out. She met with one of the gentlemen at work and she started a relationship with him. Tell me about Ian. She said, Mum, I've mm -hmm. met somebody. And I said, OK, great, fantastic talk. Tell me about him. And uh, she said he's a lot older than me, 12 years, I think it was. The Marsdens were delighted. Ian treated Renee well and made her happy. However, it was only a matter of time before Camilla reactivated Braden. Ian started getting abusive messages from Braden. So he started now feeling the brunt of 
the full brunt of Braden, not just Renee, but it was Ian as well. What were those messages? How dare you? I, I, uh, Leave she, Renee alone, she's, she's I, mine. I have a relationship with her. She's mine, I'm looking to marry her after I get out. Um, bugger off. Yeah. And here's a guy messaging from jail. Yep. In a threatening manner. Yep. yep. Ian's just a, your average guy, he's not used to this. Yeah. What was his reaction? He couldn't believe it. He was saying to Renee, you know, like, get rid of this guy, get him out of your life. He gave Renee that ultimatum because he couldn't stand the fact that he was getting all these abusive messages either. But Renee chose Braden. Next, will the real Braden Spiteri stand up? Are you Braden Spiteri? Definitely not. I'm not Braden Spiteri. Police searched Camilla Zidane's home in relation to Renee's death. They seized her mobile phone, but she'd already deleted most of the messages she'd sent in the guise of Braden Spiteri. Police did find the photo that Camilla used to create Braden in the first place. A current affair tracked down the man in the photo. Tonight, the face behind the fake identity speaks out. Are you Braden Spiteri? Definitely not. I'm not Braden Spiteri. The man in the picture is Cameron Lang. I've now got an image put out there that's an image no one wants to be associated with. Did you ever know Camilla Zaydan? No, I don't remember ever meeting her at anywhere at any point in time. Cameron later thought the photo may have been taken at a night spot years before. He was also collateral damage. Camilla shamelessly continued to lie to Teresa. When you look back, what was her demeanour through this period? Well, she was always the same. You know, Braden loves Renee, Braden misses Renee. And, you know, when we'd ask her how would she know, well, she talks to his lawyers. So she always had contact with his lawyer. So I never questioned it because I thought he's just, he must be a family friend. The closer Renee and Braden became, the less Renee wanted to do with Camilla. She was tired of Camilla's psychological warfare and wanted to end their friendship. She planned to do this when Camilla went on holiday to the US. She was gone for a month. So at the same time, Braden was going into his parole hearing and he was going to be released in the next couple of months. So both Camilla and Braden off the scene for a month. Renee had told us that Braden won't have his phone because he'll be in his parole hearing. Camilla obviously not going to have hers because she's she'll be in the States. Camilla's absence was a welcome respite for Renee. She opened up to her mother about years of abuse by Camilla. This was the first time I heard while Camilla was overseas the extent of the abuse from Camilla to Renee. It's the first time she sat me down and said, Mum, there's a problem. What did she say? She said to me, the last straw was they were driving down the road and Camilla tried to take the steering wheel out of her hands while she was driving. Camilla wanted to kill her. Pulling off the hair, punching at the head, that was it, it was done. She said, I'm done. She said she went psycho one too many times. Renee told her mother she'd messaged Camilla to end their friendship. She said to me, I've finally told her it's over, once and for all. The friendship is done. I'm not, I'm not trusting her ever again. I'm not taking her back. And I said to her, why would you do that? Why, why, she's overseas. And she said, she can't hurt me anymore, Mum. Renee poured her heart out in a letter to Braden that was found in her bedroom dated the 22nd of July. My beautiful boy, I have finally let Camilla go for good and I feel so much better about it now. I can't be without you, baby. You're my rock, my hero, my everything. 
Renee believed the lie that Braden could not return her texts because of his parole hearing. She was expecting he'd soon be released from jail and was making plans for a wedding and a Greek honeymoon. But everything changed when Camilla returned from her holiday. While Camilla was away, she had no access to her mobile phone and only read the messages Renee had sent to Brayden on her return to Sydney. Renee was planning a life with Brayden that didn't include her. So Camilla moved fast to re-exert her control. On August 13, she decided that Brayden would dump Renee. So she sent a text to Renee from Brayden saying, I think I need a break and so do you. This was perfect opportunity for Camilla to, to end it all. And on the course of that day, the way she broke it up, I think was uh, blunt and brutal. And I think that is what made Renee so distressed, is the manner in which Braden broke it off with uh, Renee. And then Braden started his barrage of text messages to Renee. And that would have been quite abusive because by the tone of the message I mm. got from him, I can imagine what he sent her. Camilla, posing as Braden, exchanged 91 texts with René on the day of René's death. Only Camilla knows the content of those messages. But we do know they drove René to take her own life. And we do know that Camilla knew the risk, because posing as Braden, she sent a text to Teresa saying, sort your daughter out. She's threatening to kill herself. Camilla could have been honest with Teresa and saved Renee's life that afternoon. But instead, she chose to create another false narrative. She pulled me out the front on the second day and said to me she had to talk to me. Everything Renee told me about her, she was telling me about Renee, that Renee was very violent. Renee used to bash her. Um, Renee was seeking help because she couldn't control her temper. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I'm thinking, I'm beside myself. I've just lost my daughter and you're worried about yourself. Coming up. Do you regret what happened? Justice. Do you regret what happened? What justice? I trusted you. You came into my home. The every occasion. Biggest belief that you can do this to another person and walk away as if nothing's happened. New South Wales police never charged Camilla Zidane for her role in Renee Marsden's suicide. The case stood still for seven years until after intense pressure from the Marsdens, a coronial inquest was finally held. Are you pretending to be Renee's boyfriend? Do you regret what happened? Do you regret what happened? Camilla gave evidence at the inquest, but she was given immunity from prosecution in return for her testimony. Did you go along to the coroner's court? Yes, we did. What were you expecting? I was expecting to Camilla, I, I guess, tell the truth, particularly when she was granted immunity. I saw no reason as to why she couldn't just tell us. Even if she didn't want to tell us everything, she could have at least told us 50 or 60% of what really happened in the end. Camilla had seven years to reflect on her actions, but in court, she chose to spin another lie, portraying Renee as a co-conspirator in the creation of Braden to hide a sexual relationship between them. Camilla Zidon admitted to the coroner Braden had never existed, claiming she and Renee had made him up together. We were never going to be accepted. She wasn't allowed to be around me. We made the character that way. She was allowed to see me, the 27-year-old told the inquest. The Marsdens were outraged. I trusted you. You came into my home. My home, I trusted you. You could have told me any time. 
and then this ridiculous story. Yeah. You expected to believe that Renee had set the whole thing up with, yeah. with Camilla in order to conceal their lesbian relationship from you. It doesn't matter if you're gay, lesbian, but it doesn't matter. If my, one of my children come home and told me that they were gay, I would love them the way they are. We're accepting. It doesn't matter who you are. While Camilla maintains Renee knew she was acting as Brayden all along, text messages and emails between the pair suggest otherwise. In a text message brought before the coroner, Brayden suggested to Renee that she have sex with Camilla to get her anger out. Renee responded with a firm no. Renee even sent sexual videos and photographs to Brayden and asked him to reciprocate, which of course he never did. Why were you catfishing your friend? Pure evil would be the best way to describe her. You wouldn't think someone could be so evil. All we want to know is just why her. You know, why, why put our beautiful family through all Luke Marsden was 13 when he lost his big sister. What was it like seeing Camilla give evidence? Oh, uh, can I say that on camera? You can. Oh, f I, if, yeah. I, it's so heartbreaking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I shouldn't cry. Just seeing the person that took his sister, it's so difficult. <sighs> she didn't deserve it. <laughs> Camilla, she had such an opportunity to come clean and she lied to all of us still, even to the point where the coroner knew that she was lying and said, Camilla, tell the truth, she still lied. That's the most heartbreaking thing. Renee's first love, Angus, wonders what might have been if not for Camilla's actions. And you see the damage that was wrought on everybody, including yourself. And the end of all this, there's no crime. This was something she had planned and executed with military precision over months. It was something that has left people questioning the judicial system at how someone can intentionally do so much harm and damage to so many people and live a matter of kilometres away from the Marsdens, still living her life as if nothing ever happened. And she's moved on. She's now got a husband and kids. She's completely flipped on how she used to see herself. And she's now living a happy life as if none of this ever happened. We still see her up the local uh, supermarkets at uh, Jewel. Bump into her from time to time. When we're shopping, don't we? Yeah. It beggars belief. The best way I can put it, beggars belief that you can do this to another person and walk away as if nothing's happened and get on with your life. I cannot imagine the heartache and distress the Marsdens feel whenever they see their daughter's tormentor. Renee never knew she was being catfished. She jumped to her death thinking that Braden, the man who dumped her, was real. The coroner concluded that Camilla, the catfisher, was the sole architect of an astonishing deception. However, he stopped short of recommending criminal charges against her. And at the end of all this, the coroner notes you're hurt and, and the, the terrible things mm. done to you and your desire for a law that protects other families in the future mm. from this happening and says, I'm sorry, I can't make a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. That's... How does that make you feel? Oh, it's a slap in the face. The Marsdens feel the law has utterly failed them. It may be too late for Renee, but they want to see the legal definition of catfishing broadened to include what happened to Renee. We can't allow this to happen to any other kid. Boy, girl, doesn't matter. 
she hasn't gone in vain, and I'll make sure of that. I want to clear Renee's name. Next, the big push to introduce Renee's law. We want catfishing to be outlawed. We've got to do something, and we need to do it pretty soon. The New South Wales coroner found that Camilla Zidane was solely responsible for the deception that led Renee Marsden to take her own life. However, police were unable to lay charges against her because they lacked evidence to prove that she or anyone else actually encouraged Renee to harm herself. Suicide itself is not a crime, um, but the encouraging of a person to commit suicide where the person does take their own life is typically a crime in most Australian jurisdictions. But the burden of proof is high and the evidence must be so explicit that someone literally has to say, why don't you go kill yourself to get such a case up, is that correct? I think you're just adverting to one of the real problems in relation to Renee Marsden's death. And that is much of the critical evidence has not been able to be recovered. Before police seized Camilla's mobile phones in December 2013, she had deleted thousands of text messages she had sent to Renee under the guise of the fictitious Braden Spiteri. The 91 messages exchanged on the day of Renee's suicide were of most interest to the police. They could have shown exactly how far Camilla pushed Renee on the day of her death. However, Camilla deleted the messages and attempts by police to recover them failed. So whatever happened to Renee's phone? Police recovered her old phone when they searched her car at the Gap. However, her new phone was never found. It's believed she threw it over the cliff before she jumped. Teresa went to Vodafone's Sydney headquarters, seeking Renee's phone data for more answers. I went down with a friend of mine, walked in. A lady came down and spoke with me. I told her the situation and she said, I am so sorry to tell you, but after seven days, all messages, uh, they go up to like cyberspace and then they disappear. Unless the police ask to put that phone on hold, nothing gets kept. So my world crumbled at that point because I knew... We were too late. We were too late. This brings us back to the Marsden's campaign to have the law changed in the wake of Renee's tragic death. As the law stands, catfishing is only a crime when someone seeks to benefit financially from the deception of a victim. Renee's case wasn't about money. Camilla just wanted to have total control over Rene. But the coroner, to her credit, she recommended at the end um, making changes to the domestic violence laws to do with coercive behaviour or coercive control, which would encapsulate Camilla's behaviour. It was a scene of unimaginable, inexplicable horror and grief. Inside the burning SUV, the tiny bodies of sisters Lena, Alia, and brother Trey Baxter. In 2021, the Queensland government announced plans to set up a task force to investigate coercive control laws in the wake of the horrific murder of Hannah Clark and her three children by her estranged husband. Reviews into coercive control legislation are also underway in New South Wales and the Northern Territory. Most coercive control offences are limited to the relationships that they cover. Typically, they will apply to persons who are married, 
or who've been married in the past, who are living together in some form of intimate relationship. When a relationship is conducted entirely through text messages, one of the first questions I think that will arise is, does this fit the sort of relationship that coercive control laws are meant to cover? Now, it may be that it does. I think the fact that they did various intimate exchanges through the text messages, that they planned a wedding and that Renee had actually booked a session with a wedding photographer indicates a degree of intimacy in that exchange. So I think a coercive control offence remains a possibility if this was to occur in the future. Even if coercive control is covered by new legislation, this wouldn't be retrospective. And it wouldn't be enough to satisfy the Marsdens who have been through so much. They fear another trusting person like Renee could fall victim to the cruelty of catfishing. We want catfishing to be outlawed, where you take on a false persona and, um, and use that to mentally control somebody or mentally abuse them, whatever. That, to us, needs to be made illegal. So it's up to the politicians now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What response have you got from them so far? Everybody agrees this is problematic. It's just getting them to act and do it. What we want to do through the media is to get some momentum there to say, yeah, based on this story, we've got to do something and we need to do it pretty soon. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not going to go away. The coroner's findings in Renee's case are available online and I urge everyone to read them. You'll understand how the law cannot protect your loved ones from the same fate. Social media dominates young people's lives, but it's also a new front for criminals and the unscrupulous to harm them. Renee's death is a tragedy that really should inform how social media is regulated. And now it's up to the politicians and the legal profession to find a lasting solution. I think before Friday, we need Jake and I need to get the ute and get all those tiles. Yeah. Because As the Marsden family tries to move on with their lives, the trauma of Camilla Zaydan's outrageous deception is still evident. It impacts everybody, every day. We've lost a daughter. I've lost a best friend. <laughs> 